How many believe in the power of thanksgiving? Yes. Thankful. Yes. Thankful. Thankfulness that opens the door to that gratitude before the Lord. Opens that door to generosity. A different person. When you look at somebody that, and we're all challenged by it, but we want to stay out of it. But if you look at somebody that is struggling with being unthankful and they get over in that unthankful, how many know that also leads in a progression? And uh, the Lord tells us about that through his word. It starts leading you into unholy things. It starts leading you in things that are unloving. It starts leading us in different paths. How many know thanksgiving? It's a spiritual principle that God says if you'll hold on to this, in your thanksgiving, it's going to make a way for you that you will see what other people don't see. Right. It's going to open a door spiritually that's going to keep you in a place where you, it's like seeing above the clouds. You can see what other people do not see. Thankful. Thanksgiving is not just a once a year thing for us. We belong to the Lord. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We understand the power of walking in our lives and just those simple things. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. He's promised in his word that he causes all things to work together for the good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to His purpose. doesn't mean He sends everything, but He said, some way, somehow, I will, in your life, take everything and mix it up in the cake bowl. And it's going to work together for your good if you'll walk in my love. And how many know part of that is stay thankful? Stay thankful. How many know there's something to be thankful for? Even in the midst of the most horrendous storms, there's something to be thankful for. So how many tonight as we gather and we come back and we say, Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for what you've done this morning. Thank you for what you're doing week by week, day by day. And now we're able to gather and praise him and thank him. And we're thankful. Yes. Amen. How many know that changes things? Yes. It causes a total different spiritual perspective. And when people sometimes are struggling, I tell people with a, as a pastor, it's kind of like spiritual doctors, you know. And people go to the doctor and they get their vitals checked. And when people come in and they want to counsel and we need to, there are certain spiritual things we need to check. There's certain things we need to look at because we may be able to fix pretty quick something that's going on because we build our life in spiritual principles that the Lord says, I've given them to you and I want you to hang on to them so that you can continue to walk, navigate life, put the devil in his place, walk in the authority of the Lord, conquer and overcome. But how many know to be more than a conqueror there's something to be conquered. To be victorious and not to be a victim means there's something we have to get victory over. And so there's things that we're going to face, but the Lord has said, I'm with you. And there's a way in the midst of everything in life to find that path in the Lord and to find the answers, the breakthroughs, the deliverances, the wisdom, to keep moving with victory and overcoming from step to step, stage to stage, level to level. And aren't we thankful? Amen. Amen. Well, if you would turn to John, John's Gospel, chapter 13. Again, thank you, Pastor, and thank you all for having us back tonight. It was an honor to be with you this morning and truly thankful for being in the presence of the Lord with you. And for all that the Lord uh, done is doing. In 
And tonight I just want to talk to you just for a little bit about the importance of the balance of good things. The balance of good things. John chapter 13, let's begin reading at verse 1. If you have it, say amen. amen. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Somebody say, love until the end. Love until the end. And how many know that just then picks up eternity? Where love is the answer to everything. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. We talked about him a little bit this morning, didn't we? And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he, know, for he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, he was set down again, and he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, I tell you. I say unto you, double enunciation, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, Happy are you if you do them. Or blessed you are if you do them. Amen. Amen. Let's stop there and let's pray if you would. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. We do honor you and we bless you and we exalt your most holy, glorious, and precious name, Master. And we ask you tonight, Father, for your anointing. I ask you to anoint us tonight, Lord, to hear from you, to receive from you, and to respond to you, each and every one under the sound of my voice. I ask you to anoint me to teach your word tonight, and I pray, Father, that you would draw us unto you, that we may look upon you, to see you, to hear from you, and in all things that we may obey, moving and flowing with you in every good thing. Clothe us, Lord, with humility and show us unto you, for it is in you we live, move, and have our being. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' most glorious name. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. When you talk about the balance of good things, how, how many believe that one of the toughest things for people in life is to stay balanced. You can look back through the church world and you can look back through history in church and you can see movements that God sent in the earth. You can see the healing revivals, but it was hard and some people got over in a ditch. The Lord sent the charismatic movement and it's wonderful and God's blessing his family and he's showing, but then people could slip over in a ditch. You have people going out naming it and claiming it and, you know, Lincoln, but they didn't have a job. 
And so the Lord had to teach, well, you got to work, you know, you got to do, put your hands to something. And so how many know it's easy as God's people to get out of balance? You ask any husband and you say, Let me talk, let's talk about your life. Let's talk about your marriage. Let's talk about your family. And anybody knows, talk to any mother, any wife, you talk, we just want to stay balanced. We want to stay balanced. And so, and how many know the Lord wants to teach us and help us in everything we do to stay balanced? To stay balanced where we're walking with Him and we understand how to mourn, how to weep with those that weep and laugh with those that are laughing. We understand the balance of good things as the Lord calls us, as He draws us to Himself and as He moves us through this world. He wants us to be able to be balanced. And in order to do that, how many know there's only one way to do it and do it successfully? And that is to stay close with Jesus. Because in Him is the balance of every good thing. And so He knows exactly. Nope, too much that. Whoop, nope, too much that. Whoop. He knows exactly how to keep us right in line with Him. This morning we talked about the importance of the Word of God. And we talked about the importance of the power of God. And we talked about the importance of holding on to those treasures, those things that the Lord has given us. When he said to Jeremiah, you stand and you tell them to stand in the way. There's old paths. There's things that have been moved from that you've got to get back to what you should be doing. It's been prepared for you. It's been given to you, but it's not been protected. It's not been taken care of. It's not been honored and valued. How many know if somebody gives you something and it's precious to you, it's treasure, you take care of it different than if somebody gives you something and it's not real valuable to you and you don't think a lot about it, you treat it differently. How many know the Lord wants us to treasure what needs to be treasured and be able to see things that are not important that they're not that important. And the treasures of life. How many know the Lord said where your treasure is? Your heart will be. I was sharing with Christy the other day. Uh, I was able to get. I don't know if anybody plays golf. But I was able to get some old ping uh, drivers. And uh, there are several of them, and they were authentic and still the same shafts on them. And, and I'd put them in, I'd set them somewhere, and Christy, of course, just trying to put, she put them in the corner. And so they were in a corner in a little place, and I started thinking about those, and I thought, boy, those things are so nice. Sometimes I just like looking at them. Anybody got anything like that? I just like looking at them. Because it's like, whoa, this is, these are way back, you know. And I just like, and so she had put them in a corner. And in that particular corner, I thought, that may not be the best place. Well, the shafts had got like a little rust on them. And I shared with her, I said, see, to you, you wasn't seeing the value. It's just a, well, oh, golf clubs. To me, I was saying, whoa, what was I thinking? I didn't tell her. When you treasure something, you treat it different. You take care of it different. But you have to hang on to those things. Or you can let it slip and you're not taking care of it like you should. And how many know those things can happen in spiritual things? Things that the Lord has passed on to us, that he's given to us. And he says, this is treasure. And for your lifetime, you'll have to tend to and take care of. Because when you've walked in it year after year after year, you can kind of get sometime complacent. Kind of numb. But how many know not everybody has what you have? Not everybody has what this church has. Not everybody has what God has blessed so many of us with. Not, and so to hold on to it, to value it and protect it is something we have to stay before the Lord. To say, Lord, teach me how to do that. Because the way of the natural, the way of the flesh, it's kind of like, well, I've moved on and I'm on to something else, but we got to hold on to those old paths. We have to hold on to the foundation, the Lord, the things of the Lord, the foundations and what He's built and given and grow in what He's told us. How many know we'll never go back to 25 cent movies? <laughs> My dad tells me about going to the movie, 25 cents. 
Same story, same time, but I like hearing it every time he tells it. And I would get popcorn, he said, and I would get a soda, and I'd get a candy bar, and I'd have changed bags. How many know we'll never go back there? But how many know I need to build in my life on the foundations that the Lord has given me? And although we'll never go back to 25 cent shows, we need to build upon the shoulders of every generation to do the things God's called us to do and not let slip the treasure. The things of God that He has given that are to be passed from generation to generation that's valuable in Him. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 26, and we'll go back to, to John. Acts chapter 26. This morning, we talked about the importance of the presence, the power of the Lord. And in the inheritance that he's given us as believers, he's called us to walk in the good things of our salvation. He's called us and says, I want you to walk in the freedom and the liberty, the joy and the peace. I want you to walk in healing that is provided for you, the healing covenant. I want you to walk in deliverance. I want you to walk in prosperity and peace. It's part of the inheritance. It's the covenant of His blessing. And it comes with him. Somebody say his reward comes with him. Amen. So it comes with him. And he wants us to walk in it and enjoy everything that he has given us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And to enjoy. And if he tarries his coming, continue to preach this gospel. And from generation to generation, make sure that we're sharing and hanging on to those things that are precious priceless in the sight of God. And we talked this morning about in, in understanding, enjoying and walking in the anointing, the power of the Lord. And I want you to notice what the Lord had done for Saul, Paul, what he done for him in his life, and then what he gives us as testimony. Somebody say, don't lose your testimony. Did anybody ever listen to a man by the name of Dad Hagen? Kenneth E. Hagin. He went on to be with the Lord some years back, but you could hear him up until he went on to be with the Lord talking about his testimony, talking about how the Lord healed him and raised him up off his deathbed, felt himself slipping away into hell, and the Lord called him back, and he was saved on his deathbed. His testimony, although he had told it over and over, it never got old. Because how many know it was built in God? Given to him by the Lord and meant to bless his people. Meant to call his creation unto him. Notice Paul's testimony. Let's begin reading at verse, verse 12. He said, Whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. More stuff that's coming. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. And how many know he wasn't talking about physical eyes? The same way of physical eyes and ears. How many know we've got spiritual eyes? 
spiritual ears, spiritual heart. And so the Lord is talking deeper here and the Holy Spirit is moving and he's bringing it before the king through the authority. And God is moving on a group of people, drawing them as Paul is sharing his testimony. Notice, delivering them from the people and from the Gentiles into whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus told Paul, I want you to do this. And then he went and done what the Lord called him to do. But I want you to notice he said to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan. So is it possible for Satan to have power and a grip over people? Yes. yes, and he does. And the Lord told Paul, I have called you for this purpose. That through your preaching, the gospel, and telling people about me and what I've done and who I am. I want to open people's eyes, turn them out of darkness to light. I want to turn them out of the power of Satan and I want to turn them where they begin to look to me and believe me and turn them to the power of God. That their life can be different. That everything about their future and their destiny will change. Somebody say, the Lord needs me. The Lord needs his family, his body, his people to do what he called each of us to do. And how many know there's people that you may not even know yet? Because how many know it's easy to kind of get lost in our world and so many things that are going on. But how many know the Lord is bigger than just what's going on in our world? And there's people and there's place, there's things, there's stuff that the Lord has for you and I. And there's a purpose. Amen. Amen. Whereupon, verse 19, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. So is it possible to be disobedient to the things of God? We're called to be obedient, but it's possible to be disobedient. How many know we want to hold on to our testimony? And we want to be obedient to share it and to share it and to share it. I don't care if you've shared it 17,000 times, it seems like. It could be your testimony of what God done for you that changes somebody else's life. It could be your testimony that maybe through time it seems like it's lost its luster. But how many know when God calls you to share it? And he puts his hand on it. And his anointing, his power begins to flow. The captives are set free. Somebody believes if he healed them, he could heal me. If he delivered them, he could deliver me. If he saved their loved ones and brought them in and it looked like they could never come out, then I guess he can do it for me. Somebody say there's power in my testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Paul shared his testimony as he was called before King Agrippa. And how many believe, as you go on to read that, King Agrippa then had a decision to make. And what was that decision? To believe or not to believe? And he goes on and says, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I just don't want you to get saved. In other words, I want everybody to get saved. You see, the Lord wants ever, whosoever will come to the Lord. He is open. He wants everybody to come so that they can be saved. How many know we got work to do? Because there's a lot of people that have been held in bondage by Satan. And how many know it is possible to live and to know and have been taught and trained but you let it slip from you and you're not exercising your faith and the devil can start coming in and think he's going to take over the whole family. How many believe God is able? He will do it. 
But we must walk in faith. We must walk in faith. Faith without words, corresponding action is dead being alone. So God looks at us and says, if you're in real Bible faith, real faith, you're going to see corresponding action with what you're saying you believe. Amen. So you believe it. That settles it. And I'm saying it and I'm talking about it because it becomes my confession, my testimony of what God has done. I receive what I have need of now and I believe him to do it and take care of it. And I'm calling those things that be not maybe at the moment as though they were because I'm moving in faith and what he has done once, I know and believe him and trust him that he will do it again. So if he healed me then, I know he'll heal me now. If he delivered me then and called me out of darkness into light, I know he'll do it for me now. If he done it for me, I know he said he'll do it for my kids. I know that he said he would do it and even if they get older and they get out they're going I'm going to I'll put I'll bring them back you see because he's bigger have you ever had to look at your kids and they was maybe just kind of acting in the wrong kind and you I'm talking about as they get bigger and you just kind of look at them and you say God's bigger I mean I don't know exactly what you're trying to pull right now but I'm just going to tell you, the Lord's bigger and ain't nothing you can do to get away from it. <laughs> How many know there's a great rest in believing him and his power? I've told people before, and you're talking about eyes getting big. Whoever you tell. I've been in counseling before with people, marriage counseling. And after you listen, you know, Pastor, after you listen, we love everybody. But after you listen so long, sometimes you, your head begins to spin a little bit, especially when you're, you know, maybe on the third or fourth time. And we're kind of going over the same things. And it's like, well, you've not done what we need to do in the first. We're still, so your eyes go. And there's been some times, and it, it got quite a, you know, it, it made me quite a name, that I've taken my Bible off my desk and just threw it in the garbage right in the middle of counseling. And you're talking about people jumping, and I said, that's the way we're living right now. You see, we're living like his word is not real. We're, we're living like his word, like he's not a, And all we got to do is make sure that we're getting his word and then anchor into him and believe him, and he'll do exactly what he said he would do. But I got to make sure I'm really in faith to believe him. And how many know it is easy? To go by way of feelings and flesh and emotions and we can let that slip. And sometimes we just need somebody to come along and just tell us and we say, oh yeah, 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 I know that. Oh, oh yeah, and the more that they're talking, they think, that's, bless God, that's the truth. I do need to get myself straight. I do need to get myself. How many know we need one another? Because this that we're in, it's not a sprint. We, we're in this for the long haul and we, we, we're, in, we're working on something here. We're, we're working on something. The Lord's doing something and he's faithful. He that promised is faithful. All we've got to do is make sure that no matter where we're at, we're lined up. We're in agreement and that we're continuing to seek and believe real faith and he's faithful. Amen. He'll do what he promised. Amen. I just need to know what he said about it. I just need to have his promise. Amen. Amen. So the power of God is available. We're born again. The spirit of God comes on the inside of us. Now the spirit of the Lord is within us. And the Lord wants us to move to the next step called Pentecost. He wants us to go through Pentecost. All of his people. Because it's a gift and the baptism and the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues and the power of God manifesting in our lives 
the gifts of the Spirit, the Lord says you need this. So you can walk because I want you to overcome and be a witness, a testimony, and lead people to Jesus. And he's faithful to do what he promised. As he did in the early church, as he is today. Amen. Amen. So we just need to make sure as we're walking in that, that we're staying balanced in the good things of God, anchored, and we're deeply rooted in. They've told me about trees, forget the name of the trees, but those great big ones that are real wide. And they say that they don't have, that their roots don't go real deep. But they go out more sideways and they link on with other roots. And it can make those, those trees so strong that no matter the winds, it's like it can't knock it over. How many know the Lord wants our roots to go down and get deep in Him? But then He wants them to be connected in the body because we need one another. Because sometimes when the storms are coming, we're standing, but we say, I'd like your agreement, and I'd like your agreement. And church, I need you to agree with me. And the Lord said, where two or three would agree as touching anything, I'll do it. So we just stay in line with him. We do what we can, and we trust him to do what we cannot. And we rest in him. Somebody say, we need to walk in the power. We need to walk. He's called us to walk with him. But do you remember when the Lord said to the disciples when they came back, don't rejoice because the demons have to run off. In other words, they're subject to you. But rather, rejoice. You belong to him. Keep your balance. Keep yourself stable in an unstable world. Understand this is where I've called you to walk. This is where I've called you to live. But make sure you're preaching this gospel and living this gospel in a stable position. John chapter 13 tells us how to make sure that we're living in this stable position as we go do what God's called us to do and don't move. How many know sometimes going through the storms of life will try to move you? Sometimes the devil will bark and he'll, he'll do that and he tries to move you. I mean, know oh, there's some things sometimes that will happen around and it seems like when Peter took his eyes off the Lord and he got it on the storm where well, the wind is blowing. You know, the sea, it's, it is raging and all of these things are happening and it's hard not to look at it. And you start to sink. Peter knew what it was to be on the mountain. He knew what it was to be in the valley. But how many know the Lord got him? The Lord got him and he helped him and he taught him. And there's things that Peter had to grow in in his life as he walked on with the Lord. The Lord said, I want to teach you and then I want you to teach others. And I want you to share with others how this works and how this is put together. When you look at staying grounded in the Lord, walking with him and doing what he's called us to do, keep more gives the testimony of how he was on his face before the Lord in the carpet. And he said, Lord, I've walked and seen so many, read with so many great men and women of God. And they walked in the power of God and they saw things that I've not seen. But it seemed like they lost their way. It seemed like they lost their way and things didn't end well with them. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, Keith, humility is your protection from deception. How many know the enemy wants to lie to us, wants to deceive us, and even wants to call people to walk delusional in areas and places of life just to where they lose their way. And the Lord spoke to Keith Moore, and I have taken that as a word from the Lord for me. Humility is my protection from deception. We need to hear the Lord. We need to know what He's saying. And we need to know we're staying in line and in step with Him. Humility is our protection from deception. 
So the question is, as the Lord has called us to be clothed with humility, how do we stay low? Even when he's called us, boy, and we're riding high with him. And we're doing things and we're walking with the Lord. But stay low, stay grounded. There's a principle that the Lord shows us here that is very important. Let me read a few scriptures and we'll bring this home. In verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter, I believe, said this kind of quick without thinking. Because, you know, he kind of had a way. Does anybody else have issues like maybe think before you, I mean, you speak before you think. And you just kind of, he's just kind of impulsive. And, and he just kind of, I don't know about you, but the Lord's helping us all with something. And so Peter had his sons. And so he said, and I think he just kind of spoke, but boy, the Lord gave him some serious ministry and some serious training that I believe marked him for the rest of his life. Not only marked him, but he began to help other people with it. The Lord looked at him and said, Peter said to him, verse 8, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. He told Peter, What I'm doing right now, you don't understand it. You don't know what I'm doing. But you'll know later. You'll know later. How many know you've got to trust him? When you can't trace him. You don't understand what he's doing. And it doesn't make sense to you at the moment. And you can't figure it all out. But he says, you have to believe me. You have to trust me if we're going to move to the next level in the next place. The Lord told Peter, he said, if I don't, you'll have no part with me. How many know if the Lord could not get Peter to obey him, to trust him and follow him, Peter would have missed out on his ministry. He would not have been able to go do the things the Lord called him to do because how many know if you're unfaithful, the Lord can't put you into real service. So if you're not faithful, how many know to be faithful, we've got to follow. And so we're called to lead in whatever area that we lead, but we're called to follow. We're called to submit. We're called in authority, but under authority. To walk in everything that we do. And the Lord has given Peter a Bible lesson, a kingdom lesson, that had to do with his life and ministry and about how he went forward. And if I don't wash you, you'll have no part with me. How many know there's things people can do to disqualify themselves? from ministry because we must each make our decision to hear the Lord to obey the Lord and to follow the Lord God didn't call us to fix people he just called us to minister to people we have to trust him to do the fixing amen Peter if you don't follow me if you don't get washed. If you don't come to me, you don't understand all this now, you'll have no part with me. Peter got right in line. He understood the severity of the moment. He understood where he was at. He understood what he was in to whatever level he could, but he understood, I have to listen to the Lord and I have to obey him here and I have to follow him. And how many know Peter was glad he did? He was glad that he looked to the Lord, listened to the Lord, obeyed the Lord, and walked on in the calling that the Lord had for him. But we see a very important principle from the Lord here. And it is completely different than what's going on in the world around us. Because the kingdom is not Burger King. You can't have it any way you want it. There is a kingdom. And Jesus said the kingdom is at hand when he walked in the earth. And now he's called us with him, in him, to walk in life and to do what he's called us to do and to believe him, to obey him, is what we do, to follow him. Right. Now, how many would say with me, Pastor, I've not been perfectly obedient? Well, there's good news for us because none of us have. He was. So when we miss it, we look and say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to help me to learn from this one. And Lord, I commit myself to follow you and obey you. And how many know he starts teaching us the importance? Get it right the first time. 
and sometimes you don't have to go through <laughs> some of the things. He starts teaching us the importance of obedience and obeying him and following him and trusting him. Now let's look just a little bit more in verse 13. You call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than him that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you, or blessed are you if you do them. I ask people, whose feet can you not wash? If you hear a certain name, and you say, I don't want to wash their feet. You think of a certain person, you say, I don't think I don't want to wash their feet. How many know the Lord says, when you look at him washing their feet, I give you an example. I give you an example, and blessed are you if you do. How many know these things touch deeper things in our heart? They touch deeper things in our heart. Things that may not even be sins of the flesh. Because how many know sins of the flesh are pretty easy to see? Somebody comes in cussing and fussing, and well, it's pretty easy to see sins. But how many know the sins of the spirit? are oftentimes harder to see because there can be some pent-up resentment and bitterness in there that hides itself. There can be some stuff in there that you don't know there until it's touched and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? But the Lord said, I knew that was there the whole time. And how many know the Lord loves us and He wants to get into the deepest places of our heart and He wants to help us and heal us and keep us well and whole. And to walk with Him and fulfill the purpose and the assignments and the things He has for us. But how many know we have to participate? Cooperate with that inward work that needs to be done. Because it's a lifelong process. Amen? Our kids growing up. How many ever had any kids that could get into rebellion? How many ever had where they looked at you and said, well, you're rebellious too. And you say, well, that parents can get in rebellion too. How many know the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft? So rebellion, witchcraft, we all look and say, I don't want any part of witchcraft. But rebellion will open the door to it. A resistance to authority. How many know God has called us to quickly not rebel, resist? He's called us quickly to humble. Yes, Lord. And how many know those things are an attitude of the heart? And how many know if you walk on one way so long, sometimes it feels like you can't break something? I'll tell our kids, my baby boy, he's 14, we don't have nary a witch in here. So we don't tolerate rebellion. Now we may all deal with it, but we got to learn how to get victory over them. Well, you won't believe what so and so done. Well, you won't believe. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's just quit that right now, and let's talk about what we need to pray for them about. How many know the things of the spirit can hide on us? Because we can paint it all up and. Eh, you do have God. But the Lord said, oh, there's some work that needs to be done in the heart. And how many of these things matter? Because when it gets down where the old folks, rubber meets the road. It matters what's in you. My pastor used to tell a wonderful story, so profound, but yet so simple. If you're hanging a picture and you're putting a nail in the wall and you miss the nail and you hit your thumb, that amount of pressure and pain is going to bring something out of you. Wonder what it is. Is it glory be to God or is it something else? Because how many know there's enough stuff that comes in life and the devil puts his bet, if I put enough pressure, I can get them to quit. 
If I put enough pressure, I'll break them. If I put enough pressure, but how many know the Lord said, I've already factored all of this in and I know how to empower you, to prosper you, to grace you, that there's nothing the devil can do to get victory over you if you won't participate with him. If you'll say to him, nope, not one. And how many know the fruit of the spirit is protection from deception? The fruit of the spirit, what is it? Love. Three for us, three that we need for other people, three with the Lord. The Lord gave them to us. It's not us, it's Him. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of God. And He's in us. And He says to us, I need to get you more and more as the days are becoming more and more evil in an understanding of how to walk with me and talk with me and do things my way and understand your flesh has to be put down. Your feelings, we have them, we need them, but they can't lead us. Because they can become an idol. Do you know what I believe one of the greatest forms of idolatry happening right now is people living by their feelings. Because feelings can become an idol. And the Lord said, I've called you to live by faith, not feelings. Feelings can lie to you. Feelings are fickle. They'll be all over the place. How many of we got to tell ourselves, self, you're going to get up. We tell ourselves, so we have to be able to get victory. And how many know we're looking so many times for victories out here and God wants to give them to us, but how many know he wants us to have victory in here? And he wants us to have victory in our marriage and he wants us to have victory raising our kids. He wants us to have victory in our family. In everything that we're doing, he wants us to have victory. And so how many know we need to be a balanced people? Walking in the power of God. Walking in the love of God. Faith works by love. Faith works by love. Anchored in Him. God is love. The things that He deals with us on the inside. Things like He said, forgiveness. I sat with a dear lady one time in our church and she was having some issues, family related. And how many know the boy, those things can bring out feelings and emotions like nothing else. Oh, and she was having such a hard time, literally to the point, I thought she may be having a nervous breakdown. She was shaking. And I talked and I was listening. She was crying and, and, and it was over something going on in her family and the family was there. And so we was doing a little damage control right there before church started and different things. And, she's, and I said to her, you just have to forgive him. And she said, I can't forgive him. And how many know that's more common than what we might think? That people that feel like those feelings are so strong. They're so strong. They're so... But how many know those feelings for that precious lady? She was the Lord's. She just had to learn to get out of those feelings. That seemed like they were so strong that they were overtaking her that she couldn't get out of them. How many know the Lord had to teach her? You can, by faith, forgive. You must forgive. Amen. Get that out of you. Get that out of you. Get that out of you. Lay down any offense. Offense. Well, I know I lay that down. Lord, I don't take offense to that. What's my place to bless them? Things of the heart that when we read this in John chapter 13, the Lord simply says to us, there's going to be things that happen. Obeying me in the moment may not feel good. It may not even be something that you understand, but as you listen to the Lord and obeying what's on the other side of it is the reward and the victory and the growth and the deliverance and the development of doing things God's way and maturing in Him. Right. Amen. Amen. Whose feet can you not wash? Would you not want to wash? How many know tonight, each of us just need to make a decision. Lord, there's nobody that I don't forgive. There's not anything that I don't lay down in the fence. Because I want to be right with you in what you've called me to do. Where you've called me to go. Who you've called me to minister to. 
and the things you've called. And how many know I believe, you may believe this with me, that the Lord is getting us ready, preparing His family, His people. And a lot of the work that God is doing with us as His people, have to, it's an internal work. It's a development in things that God's doing in us and through us and about us to get us ready for where he wants to take us and breakthroughs and things that he wants to do in our lives, our families, our communities. God wants to do. How many believe there's an awakening coming? God's going to touch. He's doing some things. And I just want to make sure I'm right in the middle of it. How many agree with me? And say, I just want to make sure I'm right in the middle of it. Just want to make sure I'm right in the middle of it. So sometimes in life, things can seem, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me right now. But how many know you may understand it and it make a lot more sense later? The only thing that's important now is just having the mind of the Lord. Hearing Him. And then obeying Him to do what it is He's called us to do. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Over in John chapter 6, we see where the Lord began to teach a little bit deeper to his disciples, to those following him at that time, about drinking his blood, eating his flesh, talking about covenant, spiritual things that they were hearing natural. And the Bible says that many of them said, this is hard saying, who can handle it? And they left it. And the Lord then looked at his 12 and said, will you go too? How many know when you start getting into the deep, and I believe this is a church that is a deeper things of the Lord church. How many know when you start getting into the deeper things of the Lord, the sacrifice, the commitment to walk in those places, God may ask things of you that you say, well, it don't seem like he's asking it of, but for you, where God's taken you. How many ever raised your kids and say, I don't care what all the other kids are doing. You belong up in this house. <laughs> I'm your daddy. This is your mom. You don't, I don't care about it. They, that's their family. We're talking about our family. How many know for us, God's people, he may be asking things of us that's a little different than maybe somebody else because we're not measuring ourselves and judging ourselves by ourselves. We're just making sure we're faithful with the Lord. So my question is, as we close, what is the Lord asking you and dealing with you about? What's He working on the inside? What's He bringing in and what's He working out? Because how many, like me, say, I believe that's something He's working with me all the days of my life? That's something he's dealing with me about and working with me all the days of my life. And I want to be found faithful. When the Lord speaks to me, I want to be quick to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When something happens and something, I want to be quick to say, Lord, immediately I, I'm, I'm responding to this and I'm, I'm ministering to this. And not 30 minutes, not an hour, not. Because how many of that old selfish stuff? Those old self sins. Selfish. Self-absorbed self-centered, self-focused. All that stuff the Lord wants to be able to get out of us. Amen. Somebody say, Lord, not my will. Lord, not my your will. will be done. Lord. If anything comes to your heart, comes to your mind right now, and you say, I believe this is something the Lord is dealing with, would you bring it before the Lord right now and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, if there is anything in our hearts, on our minds, that you're bringing into alignment, that you're bringing into agreement, that you're bringing into focus and clarity, help us to hear you, to receive from you, and to respond in you. You are the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of the breakthrough. And I pray for each and every one under the sound of my voice that where you've called in each and every life, mamas and daddies, husbands and wives, families, 
workers, jobs, and every assignment and every calling, every gifting. I pray, Father, that there would be a fresh anointing. I pray there would be a fresh anointing, Lord. And I pray that you would touch and that you would draw and that you would continue to heal and mend. And I pray that you would draw us close to you. That you would strengthen every heart. That you would strengthen every mind. That you would strengthen every relationship. That you would strengthen every family. And wherever the enemy would be trying to find his way in, I pray that you would give divine wisdom and revelation for the doors to be closed. prayed by your great power master that there would be a refreshing that they would be a renewal that you would move us into living in perpetual revival that you would move your people into a place Lord of overcoming and conquering in every place that it seemed like it was not happening. And Father, we believe you to do it as we agree together tonight. A quickening, a strengthening for every heart, and every home, every family, everyone in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for it. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen and amen.